okay. <clears throat> First off, I want to talk about the about the meaning of fear. Okay. It's all of it, all of this is pretty standard. I mean, it's pretty self-explanatory, but if you have questions, please do not hesitate to ask. Okay, the, the definition on the left, I'm gonna be honest with you. I actually looked them up on Google so you don't have to. So, you know, that sort of stuff, because let's just face it, none of us use dictionary these days. So, right, so the first one it says, it's an, an unpleasant emotion caused by the threat of danger or pain and fear. And then on the right-hand side, I say in musical terms, what does that mean? So for example, I'm, I'm sure we all, you know, have experienced this. I live in fear of my wrong notes and memory lapses. Yes, I think we all agree on that, you know, sort of because of the standards of uh, technical excellence that's been set in performance these days that we see in social media, any wrong notes and any memory lapses is sort of frowned upon. Now, the second definition of fear is the feeling of anxiety concerning the outcome. So, for example, you know, and I have the musical term here, I worry about tonight's, this evening's performance, you know, fear of anxiety, you know, not something that you look forward to. And finally, a mixed feeling of dread and reverence. And this is important, really. Reverence is respect, but there's also dread. And I, I see this often in amongst my colleagues as well. I have a colleague whose name I don't want to mention, uh, but she's not watching this anyway. So hopefully, you know, she, this won't get back to her. But, <laughs> but she, her dream piece is to play Beethoven's Emperor Piano Concerto. But she kept saying to me that, Michael, I would never be able to play Beethoven's Emperor Piano Concerto. But I just didn't have the heart to tell her that one of the reasons why you can't play or you think you can't play Beethoven's Emperor Piano Concerto is because you want to play everything looking at the score. It's because you don't trust your memory enough. Because in, in essence, if you look at it, for all of us who study Beethoven Piano Concerto, so know the Beethoven Piano Concerto, the fifth Piano Concerto is probably easier than the four, because if you can play your scales in arpeggio, number five is really straightforward. Number four, I think it's a bit more complicated with the subtleties with the orchestras and, and, and the blending. So, you know, and, and it's the same. Some people said to me, I'll never be able to play the rap free or the list transcendental studies. And then they hold these pieces in such high regards. I believe that everything is possible. Everything's possible because you want it to be possible. You have to answer within yourself to do this. When I started studying the rock free about two or three years ago, about three or four years ago, I, I can't remember. I looked at the notes and I said to myself, wow, that's, that's a lot of notes here. He doesn't make it easy for, for, for me. So what I did was I took one bar and I said to myself, today, I just want to play one bar. I just want to get this bar slowly. And the next day then I'll get another bar. Then two bars becomes four bar. Then eventually I have a page and I thought, well, actually that's not so bad. Now let's try for the next page. I mean, it took me two and a half years to eventually teach, you know, in the midst of all my teaching and, and working and, you know, to learn the entire concerto and memorize the entire concerto. But, you know, it's, it's something, I, it's such a wonderful experience to be able to, you know, to, to, to do that. Okay. Any questions so far? Good. Nope, we're all on the same boat. Good, excellent. We move on to the next. <clears throat> okay, now having addressed, spoke about fear, now we spoke about freedom. So what's the definition of freedom? So here's, here's the first one. The state of not being imprisoned or enslaved. Okay, very technical term that you have here. So in musical term, it translates to, for example, I'm able to perform with a degree of freedom because I'm prepared, or I know that I'm well prepared. I've done my dummy rehearsals. You know, I know that I've I played this repertoire before. I'm comfortable. <laughs> Excuse me. And then the second definition is that the state of not being affected by. And I said this is very loosely. For example, someone might say psychoanalysis and medication allows me to perform without being affected by my nerves. And of course, conquering your nerves, I always say it's probably the biggest thing, you know, uh, for all performers, you know, I mean, we all, we have all experienced that we've gone up stage and we're shaking by the leaves. And then when you see the piano in, in, in front of you and looked at the audience and, and trust me, it happens to everyone. You know, I'm sure you hear, you've heard the famous story of, of Adele Marcus. Have, has, does anyone here 
no, heard, heard of the name, uh, Adele Marcus. She was one of um, the 20th century's greatest pedagogy. And there was a fame, you know, there was a legendary sto story about her that when she made her debut playing the Schumann Piano Concerto, um, was, uh, she walked on stage and she was very nervous, of course. And, you know, the Schumann Piano Concerto, the orchestra goes, pam, then the piano goes, tram, bram, 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 all those dots of rhythm. So she was very nervous. She sat there and then the orchestra goes, pam. And instead of her playing the piano entry, she went, whoop, whoop, and then she threw up on, 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 on the piano. And that was the end of her performing career, you know. And then she then became one of the greatest <laughs> teachers of the 20th century, you know. So nerves affects everyone. We all have nerves, you know. I always say that if you're not nervous, it doesn't mean anything to you. I mean, my brother-in-law said to me a couple of weeks uh, ago when I was at his um, wedding, you know, when he was standing there, you know, about to marry my my wife's sister, you know, my sister-in-law. And he said to me, he says, I never imagined myself to be so nervous. And I said to him, he's also Michael. And I said, Michael, I said, if it's not, if you're not nervous, that it would not mean anything to you. I think the greatest one of us, uh, Marta Agric gets very nervous. If you've seen some of those behind the scene footages that her daughter took, you know, before she goes on, she's like, you know, that, that sort of stuff. And also there was a story of Clifford Curzon before he went on stage that he was so nervous. It, I, I'm not sure if it's Clifford Curzon or someone. He, he, he actually punched a, a, a mirror and then that actually calmed him down. And when Horowitz was making his debut comeback, uh, you know, concert at the Carnegie Hall, he, he was so nervous, anxious that he doesn't want to go on stage that he literally, he wanted to turn back. And then his manager actually had to turn him around and push him at the back to get him on stage. So if these are the greatest performers and some of the greatest musicians of the 20th century, and they battle with nerves all their lives. I think we can cut ourselves some slack, don't you think? Okay, right. Next slide. Let me just have a sip of my water before we talk about this. Um, now, I've Michael, also... I, I, have a, I have a question about sure. the previous slide. And you mentioned something that is really interesting. Uh, you talk about medication. And it seems that there's a little bit of a stigma around the use of medication uh, in, in performers. Um, I, I know that some pianists do take propranolol, for example, you know, before they go on stage, because that helps with the shakes, it helps with the nerves. But it's not something that gets talked about much. There's a lot of stigma around it, as if, you know, taking some kind of medication was like, like a taboo or, or it was almost like cheating. So what are your thoughts on that? Uh, Miguel, that's a, actually a very, uh, a very good question. For me, I'm quite old fashioned. I don't care what medication you, t you take. Even if you take heroin or you take <laughs> drugs, you take takes or whatever, as long as you go up stage and you play the music and you convince me with the performance, I don't care. You know, it's a very personal thing. For mm -hmm. example, I would get very, very nervous at one stage and I would take some of just a tiny bit of, of beta blockers. And mm -hmm. my wife, you know, when, when I told her that she's also a doctor and she, discourages me from doing that because she felt that by me taking these, you know, suppression that will, uh, what's that, uh, that suppresses my nerves, it's, it's actually will hinder my performance because I'm going against what the body wants to do naturally. I have to learn to deal with, with my nerves. And what I feel it's very important is that nerves usually it's linked in a lot of the time with our own sense of insecurity, childhood traumas, and all that sort of stuff, which I don't really want to talk about in this presentation, because I think it's one of those taboo subjects again. And, you know, if there is, you know, uh, I'm, I'm very happy to talk to, to you in person ab about it, Miguel. But I think it's yeah. also one of those things that makes people uncomfortable. You know, I mean, I, I know, especially when a lot of teachers said to me uh, before, and I've heard teachers say, when you go on stage, you have to let go of your fears, you have to trust yourself, but it's not so easy. It's, we right. all know it's not so easy when you go on stage. Yeah. It's, 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 mm -hmm. it's very, very, you know, um, you know, uh, sort of uh, very, um, it's very personal. And mm -hmm. when you, go, and Miguel, also when you said about uh, cheating, I, I don't think it's cheating in, in, in the sense, um, because from my experience, from what I've been told, even though I, didn't study with him, one of 
the 20th century's pro most prolific performer, Lamar Krausen, who taught at University of Cape Town for many, many years, he would get terribly anxious and nervous when he, before he plays concert and he would take beta blockers all the time, you know, mm -hmm. and yet he still managed to play performances. So I'm quite old fashioned, like, 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 like I said to you, I'm quite old fashioned in, in, in that sense. I don't care what medication you take, you know, you can go up there and drink whiskey and, and then play the Schumann Toccata and play it like an absolute goddess, you know, I want to hear the music. It's like playing with score, something that we will look at in the ne next slide. Some people have this taboo. No, you can't play with score. No, no, you have to do this, do that. I said, why does it matter if you can convince me that you can play a great performance? I don't care what you do. You know, you can wear pajamas and go out to play. I've seen some of the craziest stuff on social media these days. Now, this is the make me go. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell, tell all the audience now. Some of the stuff that I've seen on TikTok or seen on YouTube is that, that people are starting to play the piano semi-naked, wearing 90s and lingerie, you know? Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, I don't have the links to those sites, but I mean, you know, that, 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 that sort of stuff, but that's one way of getting viewership. But unfortunately, the music doesn't come across because it's just too distracting. You're not, if you're gonna go upstage and play half naked, I don't think people will be look, listening to your, your playing. Am I making sense? You know, yeah. unless you play yeah. even more beautifully. But anyway, let, 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 let's get back to, to, to the next slide. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, no problem. Uh, right. The first um, fear that I, I have, yes, you can see I have fear here and then freedom here when it comes to interpretation. Right. One of the fears when it comes to interpretation is what I think is the weight of tradition. For example, and I know a lot of teachers uh, spoke about this, especially teachers in the East. You know, for example, there's only one way of playing Bach, one way of playing Mozart, one way of playing Beethoven, etc., etc., etc. And it becomes a, quite a sort of you know, rigid sort of um, way of looking at music or looking at the interpretation. I've had students who I've given masterclasses to who text me or who phone me and say, Dr. Lowe, you know, my, my teacher couldn't quite, you know, sort of like, I couldn't seem to please my teacher no matter what I do, because for her or him, there is only one way of playing something. Now, that's fine if that's what you want to believe in, but this is how I encourage people to think of interpretation. I believe that there is no direct line. No one has a direct line to Beethoven, Bach or Mozart, unless you're playing the music of a living composer. But then again, if you're playing music of a living composer and you write to John Williams and all the stuff that he might not write back. So in that sense, because none of us have a direct line to any of those composers that we play, we actually, cannot tell what is it that they want the music to sound like. But having said that, I'm not saying that when we perform Mozart or Beethoven or Chopin or Liszt, we don't have to adhere to some sort of like structural integrity or historical, don't have some sort of historical background as to how the music should be played. But when it comes to things such as rubato or layers of sound or colors, all that sort of stuff is very, very personal. There is no one way of doing things. The most important thing is to be convincing in what you do. Because if you're convincing enough, in my opinion, then you can convince anyone of, of, of anything, basically, literally anything. Cool. Any questions? No. Okay, cool, we move on. Now, this is the second one, the weight of obligation when it comes to interpretation that might hold people back. This is more like a, an Oriental or Asian thing, not so much in the West, I, I feel. And that's why I, I bring it up. Because in the East, when people, people that study music or study goes to job or where, where they're, they're growing up, we are taught to respect our elders and we were told, that we are only here because of our parents. Our parents are the people that put us here. So there is a sense of obligation, you know, and this translates into music when you go upstage to play. So you not only play for yourself or you play for the composer, you play for your parents, you play for your teacher. And if you play wrong notes or you don't play a performance that you think is acceptable, then you feel that you let your teachers down. I don't think that is the case, for example. I think 
in my humble opinion, or not so humble opinion, I think a, a, a performer has enough obligation as it is going upstage to play. It's enough, it's hard enough to go upstairs, to go upstage to play. So I think one should often play for oneself. One should always play for oneself. And the most important thing is to be true to oneself in your performance. I'm not sure if you know the story when Arthur Rubinstein started performing Chopin. Now, everyone knows that Rubinstein is, was one of the 20th century's greatest Chopin players. But when he started performing Chopin, his version of Chopin was very, very different from what was accepted Chopin playing of that time. Because the Chopin playing of that time, Chopin was seen as a very salon, not a serious composer, but a salon type composer, you know, who's, excuse the term here, quasi effeminate, you know, who's doomed by tuberculosis. So everything was slightly hazy, you know, wishy-washy, you know, like, not, I wouldn't say wishy-washy, lots of rubato. But Rubinstein doesn't see that. Rubinstein saw Chopin as a very serious composer. So when he performed his Chopin, the, his Chopin was very strict, you know, rhythmically anyway, compared to the 19th century salon type Chopin. And initially he got a lot of backlash from it, you know, and people say that, you know, why is it that you have no rebuttal in your Chopin, blah, 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 blah. But he was adamant. He says, this is how I feel that Chopin has to play, play. I'm going to stick to my guns. And now, you know, hindsight showed us that his Chopin is revered as some of the greatest Chopin, you know, performances in the 20th century. So I think one has to be true to oneself, you know. But then again, on the other end of the spectrum, I've also come across, and I don't want to give these guys any airtime because I don't deserve it. I've, I've come across, th there's a YouTube channel of a guy who insists on playing everything half speed, literally, because his argument is that if you have a metronome, one tick of the metronome, there is not one beat. He's, he calls it the double tick, uh, double tick theory or like double beat theory. So it's two ticks of the metronome equals one beat. So can you imagine? So everything, so instead of playing everything in crotchet equals 140, for example, now everything is crotchet equals 170. So everything is half speed. And he felt that that is the way to play all his music. You know, that for me is, you know, just two way out for me. Or, I'm, or I say in that instance is that your reality is not my reality, so that's fine. So we move on. Okay. Now, now weight of expectation. Now, this is also an important one because we often see on social media and we see on YouTube performances of great, great pieces perform absolutely spotlessly. But what we don't often understand is that how much work it takes for the piece to get to where it is. There is a story when Dino Lipati was asked to play the Beethoven Emperor Piano Concerto. And he said, well, actually, you know, just give me five years. I need five years for that. Now, he's not talking about learning notes, of, 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 obviously, you know. He's talking about the, learning the piece and the piece has to go into the cellar, like, like making wine and, and, and mature. And, and that is the... The truth, a performance itself, a performance of any musical work is like a ladder. If say, for example, someone decides to play, and I mentioned this because I'm relearning the, the entire set, the entire list transcendental studies. Okay. In your debut performance, you can't expect yourself to be a Lazar Berman or George Bollet or Danny Trifolov. There is no ways in you know, God's earth that you'll be able to do that on your first performance. Because if you are, then you're just, you know, you're something else, you're not of, of, of this world. Of course, the first performance is not that great. And then, then when you play it again, you go back and you analyze what your performance, what's, what, what's, what you're happy with and what you're not so happy with. And then you go to try things that works and you're, you keep the things that works in the next performance and the things that doesn't quite work, you try other things in your next performance. And then eventually you get to where you want. And that only comes from going, playing the piece over and over and performing the piece over and over and, and over again, being comfortable uh, playing the, the, the pieces so that you know where all the pitfalls and the certain thoughts that needs to go into your mind, you know, when you're performing certain passages. I don't know if there are any golfers here. Um, 
that plays golf. At one stage of my life, I played a lot of golf and I love golf. And one of my favorite golfer was the American golfer Ben Hogan, who no longer exists. Now Hogan has one of the most beautiful golf swings ever. And for anyone that plays golf, they would know that to forge a golf swing, it's if you can forge a consistent, repeatable golf swing, it it's a victory in itself. Now I was told that the story when Hogan was building his swing to win the majors, he would experiment with certain things. So he would go into driving range and then he would play, you know, say for example, okay, today I'm going to try a weak grip. So he would hit a couple of hundred balls with weak grip and he feels, okay, that feels comfortable. So he'll play a few tournaments, you know, using that, trying out his, what he's worked on in the driving range. Then he, maybe he realized that, well, actually weak grip doesn't work. Let me cross that out. Let me try something else. And that's how you do it. You know, when you come to perform a piece of music, sometimes, you know, when you go in, go in there and say, okay, maybe I have to try it. Maybe my tempo wasn't quite right. Or maybe, you know, the articulation, you know, sort of like the trill doesn't quite work in, in, in this passage because, you know, when I'm under pressure, some of the things have, have happened. Maybe my fingering wasn't quite right. Don't be afraid to try things and don't be able to, uh, don't be afraid to make mistakes. I think that is the most important thing. You know, one of my colleagues always say this, it's like a boxer doesn't matter how many times you get, you know, that you get beaten down. You just have to get up again and just keep going. And eventually you'll get there, you know? And remember, we are all our own worst enemy. You know, what sounds, excuse the language now, what sounds shit to us might not sound, you know, bad to someone else in, 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 in the audience. In fact, I have played performances where, you know, the audiences gave me standing ovation. And then I actually looked at myself and said, what, you know, I, I literally am so embarrassed. I said, I, I actually don't, don't deserve the stand, standing, standing ovation, you know. But for them, it was a fantastic performance because, you know, the music come through, you know, they enjoyed it and they really appreciate all, 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 all my efforts. So what, again, what I'm trying to, trying to say is that don't beat yourself up for playing wrong notes and having slight memory lapses because other people will do that for you. Okay. Whew. Let me take another sip. Okay, now we get on to the actual performance itself. Right, here we go. Da, da, da. This is the big one, wrong notes. Yep. All performances, Everyone's, none of us likes wrong notes. But here's the thing, all performances have wrong notes. Definitely. Even the live performances have wrong notes. Wrong... Okay, good. Right, now we talk about um, performance before we were unscheduledly interrupted there. The big one is wrong notes. And as we spoke about that, all performances have wrong notes. Now, like I said, the reason why live recordings sound so perfect is that because the artist tends to go into the studio the next day to tidy up their wrong notes, or they tend to record the dress rehearsal, then they edit in the wrong note. Now, if you listen very carefully to some of these old recordings, they, you can actually hear the change of sound, the differences between amb of ambience when the audience is actually there and the audience is not there. So wrong notes is not a, a problem for me and what's important to remember about wrong notes is that no one goes up stage, uh, goes up to perform deliberately wanting to play wrong notes. I think that's very important. No one wants to go up and then play, play wrong notes. Wrong note happens because we are human beings. We are not machine, you know. Okay. Now, the second one is memory lapse. Now, this is like a sort of like a controversial one. Something that uh, Miguel said earlier, uh, not said earlier, that, that touched on, uh, you know, because we are expected to, as pianists, violinists, singers, we are expected to perform from memory. But I'm not sure if anyone here knows the, um, the history why pianists perform from memory. Now, the very first person to perform from memory is none other than Franz Liszt. And he did that because he's a showman and he did that because he wanted to, well, it was some, something different. 
But the main reason why he performed from memory is because he couldn't get the jumps of his Hungarian rhapsodies while looking at the score because the bit jumps are too big. So he has to look at his, his hands. But he did say afterwards in the document that came out that he felt that he may have presented the later generation a problem because after everyone see that, so that he was performing from memory, everyone tries to perform from, from memory, you know. Now, my take on this is that I don't care whether or not you perform from memory or you perform from the score. You just have to be comfortable when you play your recital. Performing from memory is great because it allows you a degree of interpretive freedom. I'm not saying that you can't do that with the score. You can do that with the score, but it's just harder. Now, and if you want to perform with the score, then you actually have to be specific. You have to rehearse, practice with the score. Don't do what I used to do when I was at university, that I sort of half memorize a piece. And then I, thought, I said to myself, well, actually, you know, let, let me just have the score up there, just, just in case, you know. So I would play a performance and things are going well. And I was like, well, I wonder if there's an F sharp on that passage. Then I looked up and I was like, oh yeah, there's an F sharp. Then I looked down again and I was like, crap, I lost my place. You know, so that, you, that usually happens, you know, when you don't rehearse playing with the score. Now, if you want to rehearse with the score, uh, with the score, that's okay. Have the score up there and you have to know exactly when to look up and where to look up and exactly when to look down and where to look down. But for me, as I said to Miguel earlier, and I'll say it again, I don't care, you know, if as, as a jury, as a teacher, whatever, if you perform in the score, you perform from memory, I want to hear a convincing performance. And if you can do that, then you're a winner. Then I'll buy you a drink, I'll buy you a coffee. We spoke, this one we spoke about, nerves and anxiety, you know, be uh, convinced your mu own musical message, and then find a place for your musical demon. I'm sure everyone here has seen the Marvel movie, Doctor Strange, have they not? With Benedict Cumberbatch. There is a very touching scene when Stephen Strange went to the Ancient One at the beginning, played by Tilda Swinton. And the Ancient One said to him, one can never live without our own demons. We can only live above them. Now, I, when I'm going one better than that, I don't think we can live above our demons. I think we have to learn to live side by side. We have to coexist with our own demon. We have to find a place in our lives for our own demons so that when our demons surface, they don't haunt us or they don't overwhelm us. And I think that's very important when it comes to performance, especially if you have had a memory lapse in a performance, when you get to the same place again, when you're playing the same piece, what do you say to yourself? You know, do you just freeze up and say, oh my word, I played a memory lapse last time, that, this is gonna happen, or do you say, to, uh, or you can e equally say, say to yourself, well, actually, that's my memory lapse out of the way, you know, let's see what we can do, do this time, you know, let's try something else, you know, if, if the memory lapse happen again, great, but eventually the memory lapse will stop happening and I will get it right. There's only so many times you can, you know, you can have a memory lapse in, in, in my opinion. Okay, then we go on to the next slide. Any questions? Okay, as student of the arts, I often see this. People would ask, will I, will I ever be good enough? And the question is that, yes, I think you are good enough. I think everyone's good enough, but it's worth remembering that everyone develops in their own time. There is no time limit to get to where you want to get to. Unfortunately, we live in a world and a culture where if something doesn't happen to you by a certain stage of your life or certain age, then, you know, you seem to be cast away, you know, but I don't believe that there is no time limit to anyone. You know, one of the, the phrases that I, that makes me a little grossed out is when people say, make it, you know, where, I've made it as a performer or made it as an artist. 
there's no such thing as making it. If it, you know, or if it happens for you, I mean, if, it's ha if it hadn't happened to you by the time you're 20, in, in your late 20s, it doesn't mean that it still wouldn't happen to you when you're in your late 30s. Sometimes you just need to live life, you know? And linked in with this is that, will I ever be a prize winner? And I know this is, you know, a lot of um, aspiring, talented, young, you know, artists or young students ask me that. I say pri being, prize win being a prize winner is not what it is, what, what it was. I'm not saying that don't go and win the shotgun competition. That's not why I say, oh, don't go and win the Leeds competition. Although if you want to enter the Tchaikovsky competition, I would seriously ask you to think twice because after everything that's happening in Ukraine and Russia, I don't think they recognize the world at the moment doesn't recognize the Tchaikovsky competition. So, you know, so that is the only one. So, but if you want to go and enter Van Kleiben and all that sort of stuff, then great, great, good, good for you. The point I'm trying to make is that being a prize winner doesn't, sometimes doesn't just depend on your performance. There are a lot of other factors in play in an international competition. So it's, it's very difficult. It's very difficult for me to say being a prize winner is what it's cracked up to be, especially now that we live in such an age where social media presence take president, you know, that you have so many people playing on TikToks or on Instagram. And these are technically fantastic players. Okay, fine. They only have 15 seconds, but then if they link you to the YouTube, if they can play the rest of the 15 minutes, then great, you know. And last but not least, I always say you alone are responsible for your own artistic trajectory. You know, you alone have your own answer to what you want to achieve. And for me, the most obvious thing is this, is that a teacher can tell you or give you advice on how to do certain things. But at the end of the day, you still have to go home and try things out for yourself and see what works and what doesn't work. Because we are all different. And because all of us are at the mercy of the body that we are given. What works for one teacher? might not necessarily what works for another teacher. What works for one pianist might not necessarily work for another pianist. Like, let, let me give you an example. I have a few students, Chinese students, living in Cape Town. Uh, for those of you who know, um, Cape Town has quite a vibrant Chinese community. And these couple of, uh, a few of the, couple of these students have what they call um, a practicing app developed by, I think it was Lang Lang or somewhere in China, they call it VIP Pei Lian. Pei Lian means like a practicing partner. So, you know, they would practice, they would log on and then there will be another student or a conservatory, conservatoire student or someone that has a certificate will sit and practice with them. Now, the first thing they say to all the students or my students is that you have to be in this position. That's the hand position you have to be in, okay? Because in China, that's how they play, this position. Now, I am not so, I don't want to come across a rude to say dogmatic. Fine, if you want to play like that, that's fine. But then similarly, you know, there's some, some of my students who play with slightly flatter fingers, but supported, that's also fine. And some people play with even flatter fingers, that's also fine. You know, we're all different. But what I'm very strict about is that you, you must be, be aware of tension. If you feel that there is tension here like this, which it, you will generally have, because I feel that there's tension when, when you have this position, then, then you can't play with this, this, the, the, this position. That it'll be very difficult because tension is the biggest killer when it comes to playing any piece of music. You know, So it's up to the pianist or up to the student and the teacher to sit down and work out something that works for the student. And I must say that that's one of my big passion to sit down with my more talented students and to find solution. Like I have, um, you know, a talented, you know, girl at the moment. She, you know, is playing this crazy transcription of the soundtrack from Interstellar. 
you know, and you know, her some at some passages her hands not big enough, and she we would sit down, and she said, "Well, Doctor Lo, I can't quite do the stretch here. Then what do I do?" And I said, "Well, there's certain ways you can do this. Just try this, try that, and be open. You know, there is no one way of doing something. I think that's the very important thing. And last but not least." I want to show you guys one of my favorite picture that I found. Ta-da! And I think this picture says it all. <clears throat> cool. 